Welcome to this music Q&A where it's my job to answer your questions about drumming, rhythm, and music in general. You guys sent me a bunch of questions on Instagram and I will try to answer as many of them as I can in this video. And with that, let's dive in. Always playing ahead of the beat. It's frustrating, how can I improve? Metronome isn't helping. Well, first off, I wanna say that you're not alone. I think most of us actually have a tendency to rush ahead of the beat. Now, some of us are draggers, some of us are rushers. Now, are you a rusher? or are you a dragger? But whatever the case may be, the solution is the same for both situations. The best thing you can do to improve your timing is to count. One and two and three and two and two and three, one and two. So make this a part of your practice routine where you count over everything that you're playing. And this, more than anything else, has helped me develop solid timing. Now, the reason this works is because it helps you develop your internal time. So when you're having issues chasing the metronome, it's usually a problem of externalizing the time. You're relying on this external source, the metronome in this case, for all of your timing information. But what you really need to be doing is generating the time from within. In other words, the role of the metronome should not be the source of the time, but really you should be generating that from within and only using the metronome to compare whether your internal timing is accurate or not. If you'd like to learn more about counting and why I think it's so important, I actually have an entire video dedicated to that topic by itself, which I highly recommend you check out. What is the hardest tuplet to swing to? Oh man, okay, so you might be familiar with the idea of quintuplet swing. the idea of approximating a swing rhythm within quintuplets, meaning five notes per beat. Quintuplet swing has this very cool advantage of lying somewhere between straight eighth notes and swung eighth notes, and this produces this sort of drunken Dilla type feel. There's other versions of tuplet swing. Septuplet swing is something we've used in my band, Sungazer. Now the question of which tuplets are better or worse suited to this kind of drunken hip hop tuplet feel is an interesting one. And I think quintuplet swing has a few advantages going for it. So first of all, you've got the placement of the swung note. very pleasing sound and a pleasing ratio. The ratio of three notes to two notes is 1.5, which is fairly close to the golden ratio. Now, whether that actually has an effect or not is debatable. It's fun to think about. I don't know if there's any science behind it, but the golden ratio is associated with a lot of things that we perceive as beautiful in nature. So the proportions of different things to one another. Now, septuplet swing is a very different feel to me. It's like a very different emotion. First of all, the notes are going by much faster. But they also divide in a different kind of a way. So you can play four plus three. Or what I like to do is kind of five plus two. And that's what happens in the Sungazer song, Dream of Mahjong. Now, if you wanna to go to tuplets bigger than that, things get really interesting, but they also get more complex. So if you want to play an 11 tuplet, there are many different positions you could place that swung accent. Now, the problem is the subdivision is going by so fast that you either can't really keep track of it, or you're gonna have to play at a super slow tempo in terms of quarter notes in order to make that 11 tuplet a manageable speed.
So larger templates give you more options, but they're also harder to play. So I think the hardest template to swing to is honestly anything over 10. It's not that it can't be done. In fact, I think there's a lot of really cool unexplored territory in that realm of these large templates. A lot of cool stuff you can do with that. And maybe I will have some things related to that soon. So I think anything above 10 is pretty hard to swing to, but not necessarily impossible. Drums should be called drums. What do you think? I think it's a pretty drum idea. Hey, what are the sticks that you use? The sticks that I use are the Zildjian Heavy Jazz Sticks, and I like these because they're heavy without being super big in diameter. So it's a very dense wood, which means you get a lot more weight and power without having a giant stick to hold on to. So it has the weight of something like a marching stick, but the diameter of something less than a 5A. So it's very thin, but you got a little extra something to hold on to. Any of the Zildjian heavy sticks are great. They have different versions with different tips and stuff, but I tend to use the Zildjian heavy jazz. How has touring now been compared to before? Okay, this is a great question. I just got back from two weeks of touring with my band Sungazer. This was our first run of shows since the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> I must say that I am so, so happy to be playing live music again. The biggest difference I would have to say is the gratitude that we, the musicians, and I think the people attending the concerts have for live music. We all have been missing this for so, so long, and it's really put into perspective how special it is to be in a room with people sharing in that live music experience. The short answer is touring was amazing, despite it being more complicated and more difficult in some regards in order to you know, follow the different regulations in different places. But I think as long as we can do it safe, you know, people are hungry for live music and us musicians are hungry to play. Thoughts on DCI? Yeah, I love drum corps. I am a huge hardcore fan of drum corps. I used to march in the Blue Knights Winter Line back in the day. That world had a huge effect on my technique and my early development as a musician. So really, really great community. And I learned a lot from it. favorite polyrhythm? Now, I'm not one to play favorites, but if I had to pick one, I would say go check out Project JDM's Instagram. In particular, there's one post where he plays a 69 against 420 polyrhythm, and I think it just doesn't, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, come on. Does jazz good? Does jazz good? Does jazz, does jazz good? How to learn polyrhythms and tuplets. I would say for polyrhythms, the biggest thing for me is understanding how the two rhythms fit together into a composite rhythm. In other words, when I'm thinking about polyrhythms most of the time, I'm thinking about it as one big rhythm rather than trying to focus on all of the parts individually. Now for tuplets, the greatest resource I know of is this book. This is Mike Mangini's Rhythm Knowledge, Volume 2. These books had a tremendous effect on my playing and the way that I think about practicing. Volume 1 deals with how to practice. Volume 2 deals with what to practice. And I know these books are currently out of print, but I believe there are plans to get them reprinted at some point. In the meantime, I know Mike has recently released a video course about his not quite double counting system, and that is the system in this book that I used to learn how to play tuplets. The beautiful thing about Mike's approach is that it really truly allows you to play any subdivision between 1 and 20 notes in the space of a pulse, and to do so very, very accurately. So to switch between 19 tuplets and 7 tuplets and 13 tuplets, and do so in a very, very precise, accurate way, which is something I've not seen replicated elsewhere. What symbols do you use? So for symbols, I use the Minel Byzance series. Super dark, I like dark and dry symbols, so I've got this 22-inch Byzance extra dry fin ride. Really versatile, you can play it as a ride or as a crash, got a nice clear bell. I have the 16-inch extra dry medium thin hi-hats. These are super chunky, giant hi-hats, I love those. Y'all know that I like giant hi-hats. <laughs> Then for a crash, I've got an 18 inch jazz extra thin crash. It's super dry, so it crashes and it gets out of the way. It doesn't ring for forever, just nice and short. Get in, get out, get out of the way. And then I've got this little stack here. It's two of the same symbol. It's a 12 inch classics custom trash splash. And then the bottom one, it's inverted. You just flip it out 
And that's basically my setup. I tend to keep things pretty simple, pretty minimalist. I don't like carrying around a heavy symbol bag. I do have a handful of other symbols I pull out for special occasions, but usually I can get plenty out of just these four symbols. How do I improve control in my non-dominant hand? You've just got to practice it. You've got to do everything that you've done for your dominant hand and do that with your weak hand. And that takes a lot of time. But one thing you can do is to get in the habit of always practicing things in both directions. Another tip that's been really helpful for me is whenever you're going to practice an exercise and do both versions of it, start with your non-dominant hand. That gives you the benefit of first of all, guaranteeing that you're gonna get some work done on your non-dominant hand, whereas you might start with your dominant hand and then get interrupted and never really get around to practicing with your weak hand. It also gives you the benefit of potentially being a little bit fresher, a little bit more present and aware of what you're doing when you start the session working on your non-dominant hand. So I think you should get in the habit of playing things both ways and pay attention to your technique and try to make your left hand, if that's your non-dominant hand, look and feel and sound exactly like your right hand. Not music related, are you still studying Japanese? So is ne. あ、難しいですよ。実は so a few years back, I had a YouTube channel which was explaining my method for learning languages, which I had picked up from other places on the internet. You can find that channel if you want. I apologize for the production quality. It was not that great at the time, but the project was called Japanese in a Year, and my project was to learn as much Japanese as possible in a year. And then I spent the last month of the year traveling around Japan. So to this day, I still get a lot of questions from people wondering whether I'm still learning Japanese or learning another language. And the short answer is that immediately after that project, at the beginning of 2018, I moved to Germany. So I've been living in Berlin for the last three years and I've spent that time learning German. And to be honest, German is a lot more important to me, obviously living in the country. At the moment, my priorities for languages are the languages that I speak best, which are German, French, and Italian. If I had a tour in Japan or something, I would definitely love to level up my ability, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I certainly don't need it, and I've got quite a few other things that I want to spend my time on at the moment. So for now, I'm focusing on maintaining my German, French, and Italian, and uh, yeah, we'll see what happens from there. Chocolate stout or coffee porter? Oh man, don't make me choose. Don't make me choose. Did the touch guitar make it on the tour? No, the touch guitar did not make it on tour this time, but I did get my very own touch guitar. This is brand new, just arrived. This is a beautiful instrument. I am in love with the finish on this thing. This is one of the new U8 models. This is a brand new version of the classic U8 model, which they're now able to offer for a much lower price than previously was possible due to the way that they're manufacturing these. So I got lucky. I got one of the first ones that they made and it is a stunning instrument for, you know, a lot cheaper than they used to be. So um, we'll, t we'll talk about this more later. Ninth tuplets, how do I play them? Think in three, four. If you play triplets in a time signature of three, four, three plus three plus three equals nine. Also, watch this video. What is your favorite song to play of all time? Don't stop believing. Don't judge me either. Do you know Ian Chang? Incredible drummer doing crazy things with drum sensors. Yeah, so I don't know Ian personally, but I have seen a lot of his stuff online and it's absolutely incredible. Very inspiring stuff, especially for people working with triggers. It's really cool to see drummers like Ian doing creative things in that space, so I'm a fan. When you first started playing with triggers, did you notice any major changes to your playing? So these days, how I'm mostly using triggers in the context of the band Sungazer, at least, is that I'm triggering a lot of non-drum sounds, so a lot of synthesizers, bass sounds, stuff like that, and this has a very particular effect on my playing in that it means that I have to play not only the drums, but the other instruments that I'm triggering.
So if it's a bass sound, it might mean that I have to come up with something that's musical, not only as a drum part, but as a bass line. And that can be a challenge, which means that sometimes I'm restricting myself to playing certain things. Like I might not play a certain fill, even though it would sound fine on the drums, it just wouldn't work musically as a bassist. And so playing those two roles is kind of a weird, difficult balance to strike sometimes. But if anything, it probably makes me play less, which is usually a good thing. So I guess it makes me think a lot more of the musical composition as a whole rather than just my drum parts in particular. What is the best way to incorporate quintuplet swing into my compositions? Well, like any musical device, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. Music is such a subjective thing and I don't wanna tell you how to do it. I think you should find your own path, find your own way to use quintuplet swing if that is what you are drawn to. I will say that if you need some inspiration, you can check out my quintuplet swing playlist, which has a compilation of a lot of artists playing music of all different styles using quintuplets and septuplets and other kinds of tuplets. Tips for a new drum teacher. I think one of the most important things you can do is to explain to the student why you're having them do a particular thing, whether it be learning an exercise or learning a particular piece. It's really important that the student understands the reasons behind doing this particular exercise and how it will help them achieve their goals. In other words, don't just assign a bunch of random homework without any real reason given. You've got to justify the existence of your curriculum and communicate to the student how that will help them achieve their goals. For example, if I'm talking to a student about hand technique, I will often preface it by saying, look, there's a million different techniques out there. The technique I use is just one of many different possibilities, but here are the reasons why it works for me. Here are the reasons that I chose this technique why I chose to focus more on wrist-based technique versus fingers versus something else. And here are the pros and cons of each of these. And then we'll talk about how to actually develop this technique. But at least that way, the student can see kind of my thought process for why I chose a particular thing and why I'm explaining it the way that I am, rather than just saying, this is the way that you do it, this is the right way, and every other way is wrong. So yeah, I think just explain to the student what you're doing and why you're doing it and that will always, always be a good thing in the long run. Creative fun ways to practice the boring technical stuff. To this day, I still practice the fundamentals. You know, maybe once or twice a year, I'll have like a period where I'll focus on my foot technique or something like that. And I will have to do these very basic easy motions like single strokes or double strokes. But the way I keep myself entertained and engaged in the practice session is by making it more complex in other ways. So I will find ways to work on other things at the same time. So if I'm playing double strokes with my feet, maybe I will work on some snare drum stuff with my hands at the same time, like I'm playing over an ostinato. I might put the whole thing into a weird time signature. Maybe I'll put it into 17 tuplets, and now I have to keep track of the 17, and maybe I'll play some different stickings that aren't 17, against that with the hands. So it forces me to slow down and do things right by making it more difficult for myself. And it also keeps me interested and it's not that I'm necessarily ever gonna play any of those things on a gig, but it's just more tools in the toolkit. You know, practicing all that really hard stuff makes the easier stuff that much easier. So I would say find ways to change things up to keep things interesting. You might also think about going through a list of variations. Maybe you're practicing for an hour and you have 10 different variations you wanna get through and that way you can change every five or six minutes and do a new variation of the exercise. That's another way to keep yourself engaged for a longer period of time. What should I spend most of my time on in music school if I want to win gigs? Make relationships. Meet friends, make legitimate friendships, and build relationships. I think other than practicing, this is the most important thing about going to music school. It's the community, it's the network you meet there, the people that you meet during that period will be a lot of the people that you end up working with later in your career. And build legitimate friendships. Don't just collect numbers and only call people when you have a gig. You wanna go out and do non-music things with them. Go out and have pizza, go see a movie. A big part of being a musician 
and getting called for gigs is actually the social aspect. So this applies when you go to a new city as well. You gotta be going to shows, go to shows with friends, meet the other musicians in the band. You gotta be out and about for at least a handful of years until you kind of get your crew built up. Beyond that, I would say spend as much time with your instrument as possible. You should be playing with other people as much as possible and practicing and developing your craft. Music school is a very, very unique opportunity that you really only get to do once. And so I think you should take advantage of that opportunity by really giving it your all. So that concludes this round of music q and I wanna thank my patrons for supporting this video. If you would like to support this channel, the best way to do that is by becoming a patron over on my Patreon page. If you'd like to stay in the loop for future Q&As, be sure to follow me on Instagram at Sean Crowder, and you will find me and everything I'm doing there. Thank you all so much for watching, and see you next time. Not, not quite my tempo.